Hello everyone, J3 here and welcome back to the 5 Rules of Wealth training series. We are now on part 3, the progression to wealth. Now, if you've been joining and watching the past two videos and you're back here today, I want to congratulate you for investing your time in growing your financial education. And even more so if you've done the worksheets in the past two lessons. Today, in this video, you're going to learn about the process for becoming wealthy. You're going to learn what money skills to prioritize learning and developing so that you can maximize your progress towards wealth. But for you to get the most out of this video, you need to first have an excellent understanding of the first four rules of money. You'll also need to have identified your own money values and your existing set of money skills. Because in this video, we tie everything together. So if you haven't watched part one and part two yet, please go back and go through them first. If you haven't done the worksheets for part one and part two, please go back, download them, fill it out. It's going to serve you in your journey towards improving your financial life. Let's make sure that what you're learning, you're also applying into your life. So the links to part one and two are somewhere on this page. Do your homework from there and then come back to this one when you're ready. Okay, so now that I can assume everyone here watching already knows the first four rules of wealth and you've identified your money skills and values, let's begin. Before I share with you rule number five, which talks about the progression of wealth, I first have to teach you how do we measure wealth in the first place? Because before we progress in anything, we have to learn how to measure it first. So how do you measure wealth? There are two widely used financial statements that is used to measure wealth in individuals and even in corporations. Now, don't worry about the word financial statement because even if you didn't take accounting lessons, you're going to understand this. I've made sure to make it simple for the everyday person, okay? So the first financial statement that is used to measure wealth is called the SAL-N. SAL-N stands for Statements of Assets liabilities, and net worth. Now, I know I just introduced three new terms here, so let's tackle it one by one. Assets means how much a person owns, mga pagmamayari. Liabilities is how much a person owes, mga utang. And the difference between your assets and your liabilities is the net worth. So for everyone to understand this clearly, let's go into an example. Let's pretend that Johnny here is a call center agent. Over several years of working, he was able to save 100,000 in the bank. He also owns a second-hand car that he was able to purchase through a loan. The car is worth 300,000 pesos today, but he still has to pay 50,000 pesos in the bank. Yun ang car loan niya. Aside from the money in the bank and the car, what's left are his clothes, shoes, and old gadgets, which we can say is worth just 10,000 pesos. And also, he has 5,000 pesos in his wallet. Lastly, Johnny has about 25,000 in credit card debts. So, what is Johnny's net worth? Here's how we compute it. From the given details, what does Johnny own? Well, Johnny has cash in the bank worth 100,000 pesos plus his car worth 300,000 pesos, plus his clothes and gadgets worth 10,000 pesos, plus his money in the wallet, 5,000 pesos. So his total assets, 100,000 plus 300,000 plus 10,000 plus 5,000, his total assets are 415,000 pesos. Now, let's go to his liabilities. His loans are yung mga utang niya ay, he has a car loan amounting to 50,000 pesos, and 25,000 pesos for his credit card. His total liabilities is 50,000 pesos plus 25,000 pesos equals 75,000. Now, to get his net worth, we simply deduct his assets minus his liabilities. That's 415,000 minus 75,000, meaning his net worth is 340,000 pesos. By the way, feel free to pause the video or anytime rewind if you want to go along with the computations or if that was too fast. Now, with this, if someone asks, how wealthy is Johnny? Or gaano ba kayaman si Johnny? We can answer, well, Johnny is worth 340,000 pesos. 
Now, please remember, human life is priceless. And we're only giving out these numbers to measure the financial worth of Johnny. It's because we have to put a number to his worth. And that's basically the SAL and the statement of assets, liabilities, and net worth. So how do you interpret this? The SAL is basically the sum, the total of all your financial decisions put together up to a current date, including what you've inherited from past generations, whether that's good or bad. Now, it's the sum of all your decisions to date. And in general, the higher your net worth, of course, the better. A positive net worth means that you're able to accumulate wealth. But if you have zero net worth, then that means you haven't been able to grow your wealth. And if you have a negative net worth, and yes, this can happen. If you borrow money that end up going into bad investments, then, well, you can actually owe more than you own. And this is a clear indication that you're making bad financial decisions. Now, back to the sal N. By itself, the sal N gives us a limited view of what's happening in a person's life because it's just a snapshot of what the person owns and owes. That's why we turn to the second financial statement, and this is called the cash flow statement. And cash flow simply means how the cash flows into and out of a person's life. It also actually has just three parts. First is the income, meaning magano ang kita. Second part is the expenses, meaning magano ang gastos. Lastly, if we get the difference of total income minus total expenses, we get the excess cash flow. Magano ang natitira o ang savings. Now, let's go back to the example of John here and create his cash flow statement. As we already know, Johnny is a call center agent and let's say he's earning 40,000 a month. That's already the take home pay. Now, Johnny generally lives an average lifestyle. He's just sharing a room and the rent is 5,000. His living expenses, transpo, food and miscellaneous is 25,000. Then every month he's paying about 4,000 pesos as the minimum for his credit card and another 3,125 for his car loan. With those details, let's now make his cash flow statement. First, we list down his income. Johnny earns 40,000 a month. That's his only source of income. Next, we list down the expenses. Rent is 5,000, living expenses 25,000, payment for the car loan 3,125, minimum payments for the credit card 4,000. If we sum this all up, his expenses every month are 37,125 pesos. Now, we take his total income minus his total expenses, 40,000 minus 37,125 to get his excess cash flow, and that would be 2,875 pesos. So, how do we interpret the cash flow statement? With the sal N, you get a picture of where you are financially, but the cash flow statement gives you the direction of where you are headed. Because if your cash flow, if your excess cash flow is positive, then that means you have the ability to save every month. And the larger the excess cash flow, the better. Because that means you can increase your net worth at a much higher pace. Meanwhile, if the excess cash flow is negative, then it means you're spending more than what you are earning. You are losing money every month. It means you're slowly decreasing your savings or getting more and more buried into debt. So again, the sal N gives you a picture of where you are while the cash flow statement tells us where you are headed. And now that you know what the sal N and cash flow statement is and what it looks like, we can discuss rule number five. Rule number five is wealth has a process. Follow it. Let's break this down into its two main ideas. Number one, Wealth is a process, and I'll show you the exact process in just a moment. Then number two, what it means to follow a process. I'll share with you three tips to make sure you're progressing as fast as possible. Now, as I share these ideas with you, please keep these things in mind. Today, you're going to get a framework to achieving wealth. So this is a big picture view of the entire process to reaching financial independence, financial security, financial freedom, and financial abundance. This video is not going to be about the little tactical things like where to invest or how to save or what type of business to start. Instead, you'll get a map 
that you can follow for your entire journey, whether you're a fresh graduate or already nearing your retirement years. Next, you will learn the stages to wealth, not merely steps. That's why moving from one stage to the next often takes a few years. So if you're expecting something that will make you an overnight millionaire, this is not it. Please stop looking for get-rich-quick schemes or strategies or tactics because they don't exist. What you learn today is the tried and tested path to achieving wealth. With these in mind, let's get started on the process on how to become wealthy. The starting point of becoming wealthy is to aspire to become wealthy. This is stage zero. Many people think that the first step is to earn a lot of money, but that's not where it begins because if in the first place a person doesn't want to improve their lives, then nothing will happen. No amount of knowledge or education will drive this person to improve their finances. If a person thinks that money is evil, then of course they will stay away from money. And we've covered the solution to these in parts one and two of this series. Now, since you're watching the five rules of wealth, I'm assuming you've watched the earlier lessons, then now I'm certain that your mindset is already in the right place. And we can move on to the next stages. Stage one is to create value and earn money. During the first decades of our lives, we all learn and develop skills that will eventually allow us to create value and contribute to society. And it is with this ability to create value that we are able to earn money, to earn an income. Now, if people fail to earn an income, here's what happens with the financial statements. If the income is zero or not enough, but the expenses are high, then the excess cash flow will be negative. This deficit will now have to be covered in one way or another by another person who cares for us. Or worse, you will have to borrow money. This would be the beginning of liabilities, which go into the SAL-N, creating a negative net worth. Now, on the other hand, when we are able to earn money, then we move on to the next stage. Stage two is to manage money. This stage is all about making sure you don't spend more than what you earn. Going back into the cash flow statement, the focus of this stage is making sure the expenses don't exceed the income. In the past, this used to be much easier because cash was all we had. No cash, no money, no spending. <laughs> but today, with credit cards, easy installment plans, and cash advances, it's so easy to lose track of how much we have left. And so there needs to be an extra level of awareness to how much money is left. Now, for those who fail at this step, what happens is that they move two steps backward and get buried into debt. They will be pushed back into stage negative one, where they will have to get out of bad debt before they can move on to the other stages. And yes, I'm serious here. There is a negative stage, and that's the stage of being in debt. So let me discuss stage negative one a little bit more first, and then we'll come back to stage two after. Many people think being in debt is normal because everyone they know has debt, but debt is actually the biggest obstacle to financial progress. And let me explain why. When you look at the financial statements, so you begin with the income, but because of too much expenses, there's now a deficit. You have negative cash flow. If someone doesn't cover for the negative cash flow, it ends up becoming a loan into the SAL-N. Now, as with most liabilities, they come with interest payments. Ang karamihan ng utang, merong interest. So, interest payments, it's an expense that goes into your cash flow statement. So, the following month, assuming the same amount is earned and the same amount is spent, but now you have to deal with this additional interest payment. And so, the deficit becomes bigger. And this deficit, again, becomes a liability, another loan, another debt that comes with more interest payments, which adds on to next month's expenses. And it becomes a dangerous downward spiral that can keep driving your liabilities higher and higher and expenses higher and higher. And you can find yourself just buried in debt. 
with these illustrations, I hope it's becoming clear to you why it was necessary to teach you about how to measure wealth, how to compute your net worth and your cash flow statement. Because many people borrow money thinking it will help them get ahead. But all they are doing is feeling good about a purchase that will bring about a harder future for them. Now, to give you a guide here on how much debt is too much, the answer is 30% of your income. If more than 30% of your income is going into repaying debts, you are overextending yourself. And there are two things that need to be done. First, you might have to downgrade your current lifestyle. Second, you have to figure out a way to earn more income. These two things have to be done, even if it's just temporary, until you are able to get your cash flow in control again. Otherwise, you are in danger of finding yourself buried in debt and overwhelmed with debt. If not now, then in the near future. With that, let's now go back and take the discussion back into stage two, managing money. For those who succeed in managing their money, meaning their cash flow statement looks like this. They earn an income and they spend less than what they earn. And at the end of the month, there is something left. There's excess cash flow. When you're able to do this, then you have what's called financial independence. It means you're not dependent on anyone like your parents, a sibling, or a relative. You are independent. And from there, you move on to the next stage, stage three. And stage three is all about preparing for future expenses. Once you are able to have something left at the end of every month, where does this excess cash flow go to? Ideally, it should go into the salen, into the asset side. Because every one of us, at some point in life, we'll have to deal with large future expenses, retirement, education, healthcare. This stage is all about preparing in advance for all of those things. So here's what happens in the financial statements. Each time you save and invest, it adds to your asset column. And when these assets are placed in the right investment vehicles, it will also continue to grow over time. That way, when a huge expense comes up in the future, you can take it out from your assets. And the big one really comes during retirement when the income totally stops or is dramatically decreased. Now, it's negative cash flow month after month after month. And the deficit will have to be supplemented by your accumulated assets, you know, your retirement fund. If the assets are enough, then you'll be able to enjoy a comfortable retirement. If they're not enough, you'll be forced to depend on your children or on charity. Now, during this stage, we actually prepare for three things. One, saving for small unexpected expenses and emergencies. Two, comprehensive insurance coverage for the larger unexpected expenses of life. And three, investments allocated for major future expenses like travel, education, and retirement goals. When you have already planned for these things and you're able to continually build up your funds to this month after month after month, then you have what's called financial security. Financial security is the state where you have peace of mind knowing that no matter what happens, you'll have enough today and in the future. And it's a great stage to be in. But there's still more. The next stage, stage four, is to build passive income. Passive income, as opposed to active income, is money that you can earn without actively trading your time for it. Active income is the income from your day job, while passive income is money usually earned via investments, real estate rentals, or business. Going into the financial statements, here's what's happening at this stage. So from the cash flow statement, there must be an excess of funds. This excess is now allocated to buy and create earning assets. So I just introduced a new term here, earning assets. Earning assets are different from everything else you put in the asset column because of one special condition they need to meet. Earning assets are those that can give you more income. In other words, your money is making you more money. Now, going back to our earlier definitions, an asset is anything that you own. So it can be your car, your house, your gadget. It can be your bank savings account, your mutual funds, your ITFs, other investments. It's your cash on hand. It can be a piece of land you own. But for it to be considered an earning asset, it needs to earn an income for you. So in this stage, building 
passive income. We are not just concerned with accumulating assets. We are focused on accumulating earning assets. Earning assets are special because it adds to your income. And now, with a greater income, you have more excess cash flow, which you can now reinvest into more earning assets, which gives you more income, which gives you more excess cash flow. And it creates an upward spiral towards financial freedom. And financial freedom is when your passive income is greater than your monthly expenses. In other words, the money coming into your life is automatic. You know, the money that's coming into your life automatically through your investments, business, or real estate is already more than what you spend from month to month. As you can see, this stage is the most appealing for many people. The idea of passive income, the idea of earning money without having to work for it. But I have to warn you, as attractive as this might seem, this is where also a lot of people get into financial trouble and make bad financial decisions. Why? Because when someone tries to generate passive income, but they haven't mastered the skills of creating value yet, if they haven't learned how to manage their money properly and you know control their debts, then they often end up buried in debts and end up struggling even further. An example here would be real estate investments where the monthly rent earned from the property is not higher than the monthly amortization. So instead of getting an income source, it becomes an additional expense month after month. And there are many other examples of it. But often the result is, instead of improving financial lives, bad decisions at this stage can cause financial ruin. And it's because of trying to generate passive income without mastering the crucial and earlier money skills. An interesting thing to note about this stage though is that it's optional. You can become wealthy through employment, discipline, and some basic investments. You can have financial security. Not everyone needs to dabble into real estate, business, and complicated investment vehicles to be able to retire comfortably. When you master the earlier stages, you already have financial security. And that's already a lot more than most Filipinos would ever say about their current status. As the average Filipino is actually buried in debt. But for those who want to reach the next level, you must be ready for the challenge in this stage, provided you've mastered the earlier levels. Yes, it's challenging, but it's also worth it. With financial freedom, not only do you not have to worry about money, but you also have the freedom of time. You can choose when you work, what to work on, when to relax, because money flows to you freely. Now, you might be wondering, is there a next stage when you already have so much, when you already have financial freedom? And the answer is yes, yes there is. Stage five is to bless others. This is the stage of abundance where the mission in life is no longer simply for you or for your children's needs, but you become a champion for others. You give of your time, talent, and treasures to causes and advocacies that you are willing to fight for. And if we were to put a number to this, when you're able to give away more than 50% of your income consistently into helping others, then you have achieved what is called financial abundance. And my hope is that in teaching you these seven stages, my hope is that you aspire to reach this highest level of wealth, of financial abundance. And that's it for the seven stages to wealth, the process by which everyday hardworking Filipinos can become wealthy, no matter where they start in the journey. Now, I know that I just gave you a lot of information in this training and it's okay if you might be feeling a little overwhelmed. So allow me to share with you now three tips as you follow this process for becoming wealthy. Tip number one. First, have faith in yourself. Listen, not everyone will have the determination to sit through these long videos online, but you did it. You stayed with me here throughout the five rules of wealth series. So that tells me that you're made of the right stuff to improve your financial life. I want to tell you now that you might be in a tough financial position or you might have made bad decisions in the past or maybe you're really scared because you don't know anything about insurance, investments, or business or real estate and you're thinking, you know, I'm not good with money. But if you're listening to this, you're actually a lot better, a lot smarter than when you started this series. 
So please, have faith in yourself and in your ability to figure things out. You can do this. You may not know everything right now, but I'm pretty damn sure that when you put your heart and mind into it, you can do it. Tip number two, focus on one skill at a time. There are a lot of money skills to learn, but the way to master them all is one at a time. Don't try to divide your attention to all the different stages. Instead, focus your energy into understanding just one topic, one skill at a time. That's how you get better at something the fastest. Finally, my last tip for you in following the process for becoming wealthy, and I think this is where many people struggle, and it's because they forget about this. Number three is to schedule success. The biggest obstacle to financial growth, once people start you know, desiring it, is often the time. People say, I don't have the time to watch the videos, I don't have time to read up on investments, I don't have the time to, to meet mentors, you know, network with people, meet advisors. To this I say, well then, let's make time. Take out your calendar or planner and pick out a block of time when you'll do what you're supposed to do, whether that's research a topic, call someone, finish a book, and set that time out for that specific activity. So if you find yourself saying, I don't have the time, I'd like to challenge you on that. Open up your calendar. Look, one, two, three, four weeks out, and I'm willing to bet you that you've got some days there that are wide open. So you might be saying that you don't have the time for improving your financial life, but the reality is you just haven't scheduled it. Remember, wealth is a choice. It's not an easy choice. It's the hard choice. And so when you schedule to learn about money, you are saying to yourself that at this day, at this time in the future, I'm going to be learning how to become wealthy. With these three tips in mind, number one, by having faith in yourself. Number two, by focusing on one key skill at a time. And three, by scheduling blocks of time when you'll focus on learning that one skill you need to master. By doing these three tips, you're going to experience financial progress faster as you follow the process for becoming wealthy. And with that said, we wrap up rule number five, wealth has a process. Follow it. And that also concludes our training on the five rules of wealth training series. So let's bring up the five rules of wealth. Rule number one, wealth is an important skill, study it. Rule number two, wealth is a values catalyst, desire it. Rule number three, wealth is the hard choice, choose it anyway. Rule number four, wealth is compounding, so begin today. Rule number five, wealth is a process, follow it. I hope that this lesson and this entire training series has served you. Thank you and congratulations for being here. Now, if you love this training series and you want to go in deeper into improving your financial life, if you want to learn the tactics and the step-by-step -step of getting out of debt, of growing your income, of managing your money, of getting the right insurance plans, and getting the right investments, of building passive income, then I'd like to invite you to check out my online program called Winning the Game of Wealth. It's my comprehensive online course on winning on these seven stages of wealth. There should be a link somewhere on this page so you can see the details of this course. Until the next time, I'd like to leave you with my favorite rule of all. That is, wealth is the hard choice, but let's choose it anyway. Goodbye, thank you, and I hope to see you inside the game of wealth.